Lord of all creation Of water, earth and sky The heavens are your tabernacle Glory to the Lord on high God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are holy, holy The universe declares your majesty You are holy Celebrate the light And when I stumble in the darkness I will call your name by night God of wonders beyond our galaxy You are holy I'm Pastor Jonathan, and I want to welcome you to our virtual worship service here at St. Andrew United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here. Today is a special day in the life of our church in which we celebrate the ministry of the lay people. And so today, Clark Fitzwater is going to be bringing the message, and Sheila Radocio is going to be sharing her testimony. And I'm sure that you'll be blessed. If you receive this message through email, you'll find an additional link with this week's children's message, as well as the notes and questions for reflection and discussion. So I hope that you'll take the time to look through all of that as you prepare for your small group this upcoming week. As we begin our time together in worship, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. 
loving God, we invite your spirit into this place, into our homes, into our living rooms, into our hearts and our lives. Help us to listen. Help us to be found faithful. And most of all, may Jesus Christ be lifted up in all that we say and do. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. week we have an opportunity to worship God through our tithes and our offerings and here are some of the ways that you can do that. Sheila Rodocio, and I'm here today to tell you a little bit about my faith journey. And I would love to tell you that my faith journey has just been this perfect journey with God from day one until now, but it hasn't. Um, I grew up in just an average home. Um, I was an only child. I had two wonderful parents. However, my parents didn't encourage me to go to church. My parents were not churchgoers. They never prohibited me from going to church. They just 
never encouraged it. I was very blessed, though, um, that I had three grandparents that were excellent role models for me. Um, unfortunately, I was only seven years old when I lost my maternal grandmother, so I just have very vague memories of her. But my two pawpaws, um, my pawpaw Jr., my pawpaw Kermit, they were just two of the greatest men I ever knew. Um, as far as their faith, they could walk the walk and they could talk the talk. And, you know, that, that was what I could ask for out of them. Unfortunately, I had lost both of them um, by my 18th birthday. I was also very fortunate that the church I grew up in was just a very small country church. And whoever had, on Sunday mornings, whoever happened to be going by my house first um, would stop and pick me up and take me to Sunday school and church. And someone would always take me home afterwards. Someone would always pick me up on Sunday afternoons and take me to youth group. So, you know, I had those great influences. And, you know, as a, as a teenager, your, your faith is different than what it is as an adult. And as I got older, my faith started to grow. And then um, in 2003, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and severe anxiety. And I... I really lashed out at God. I mean, it was just so hard. I can remember lashing out at God, telling him that I hated him, that I didn't want this disease, I didn't understand this disease, and that I hated him for giving me this disease. And I was so fortunate that I had a pastor at the time that told me, that it was okay to lash out at God. It was okay to be angry at him because he knew what was in my heart. And it took a long time to, to really get past those feelings. It took a long time for me to go back to church after that diagnosis. And even after I went back to church, it took a long time before I would ever take communion because I felt like I was flawed and that I didn't deserve to be in God's house, that I didn't feel worthy of breaking bread with my church family. And it was suggested that I read the book of Job. And if you've ever read the book of Job, you know that it's not um, an easy read. It, it takes a long time and a lot of study to process what you're expected to learn from the book of Job, but it was so helpful. And I hear people all the time say that they're only here by the grace of God. But I can honestly say that if it weren't for God's grace, I wouldn't be here. And I, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say this anymore although I'm not proud to say this anymore. But on November 1st, 2005, I tried to take my own life for the, for the first time. I wish I could say it was the only time, but it was the first time. For the longest time, I didn't know, you know, why God chose to keep me here. Sometimes I still you know, wonder when God's going to show me why he chose to keep me here. Because some days it's not evident to me. But about a year and a half after that, um, Carrie Underwood released the song, Jesus Take the Wheel. And I can remember hearing that song on Caleb for the first time and pulling over because I was in the car and I just pulled over because I heard those words and they just resonated so well that, you know, Jesus, you've got to take the wheel. I can't do this by myself. I've got to have you. 
And that was the, really this changing point in my faith. And I wish I could say that even after that, that it was easy. But, you know, when you have a mental illness, it's there's always valleys that you that you're, you're it's just up and down at times but God's always been there with me there's never been a time no matter no matter how low I was there's never been a time that God was not with me that he wasn't walking this journey with me there's never been a time that when I was really struggling that God wasn't placing the right people in my life that I needed. And if, if you don't know God, you need to. I mean, it, it's just that simple. I really wouldn't be able to be sitting here today telling you this. If it wasn't for God's grace, if it wasn't for the love of God and him seeing something in me that I don't see in myself. And even though I have been in recovery for almost four years now, there are still those days when I wonder, God, what is it? What is it that I'm supposed to gain from this? What am I supposed to learn from this? And I know that God will reveal it to me in his own time. I wish it were my time um, because I don't have patience. Um, I want it to know and I want to know now. And that's just the way I am. But, you know, it just goes back to the fact that I couldn't do any of this without God. I... Uh, over the years being involved in the church, I've taught Sunday school classes. I've been a liturgist. Um, I've coordinated different things. I've worked on various committees. And, you know, it, everything that I do in the church, everything that I do outside of the church is because of God. And, and, I mean, I, I just don't know any other way to say it. God is the person that, you know, when something goes right, you know, it's like, God, I know that was you. And yet, when something goes wrong, I know that I can say, God, I can't do this by myself. I, 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 I need your help. And... When people ask me about my best friends, I always tell them, you know, my husband John is my best friend. And my best friend Brenda, um, I've known since third grade. But I also tell them that God is truly my best friend. He is the person that I talk to, you know, when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm driving, um, when I'm just doing stuff at the house. When I'm studying the courses that I'm taking to be a certified lay minister, it's all about God. And it's all about what I can do for God because of what he has done for me. And I don't know, I don't know what else to say other than, you know, it, it, it's all about God, and I thank you every day for what you saw in me. And in closing, I just want to quote one of my favorite scriptures, and it's Philippians 1.3. I thank my God for you each time I think of you. Thank you for listening, and be blessed. Good morning, St. Andrew. My name is Clark Fitzwater, and I will be bringing you the message today. Let us pray.
Thank you, God, for today. I ask that your, be, that your blessings be brought upon this place. Give us strength and compassion as we move among your wondrous creation. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. This morning's reading comes to us from Paul's first letter written to the Corinthians. This letter was written around A.D. 53, while Paul was in Ephesus on his third missionary journey. Paul had received reports of quarreling among the Corinthians. There was growing division among the people, and he believed it required swift action. So he wrote this letter before leaving Ephesus, headed to Macedonia. Paul had spent about 18 months in Corinth on his first missionary journey. He had left Apollos to preach and teach in his absence. The basis of this epistle was to deal with the Corinthians and how they were treating each other. They had become carnally minded and focused on the natural world and sins of the flesh. Paul used his theological views and understanding of what it meant to be a people of God living in a multicultural and pagan environment. I will be reading from the New American Standard Bible, chapter 12, titled, The Spiritual Gifts. And I'll be starting with the first verse. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that you were pagans and you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God can say Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of ministries, but the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. And to another the effects of miracles, and to another prophecy. And to another the distinguishing of spirits, and to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit work all these things, distributing to each one individual as he wills. The first three verses here are giving us a little perspective into the situation. Paul is reminding the people of Corinth that they were pagans, but they have been brought out of that lifestyle. They are now able to exclaim that Jesus is Lord because they have received the Holy Spirit. He goes on to explain in verses 4 through 6 that there are diversities in the gifts, which can manifest in different ministries and different operations, and these ultimately glorify God. Verse 7, he charges us to use them for the building of the kingdom of God. And in verses 8 through 10, he lists some of these gifts. In verse 11, that one, he gives us a little clarification and, and tells us that one and the same spirit works all these things. And he distributes them as he wills. Paul is trying to correct the confusion that has come about over the importance of the gifts. There has been growing dissension of the Corinthian people over the thoughts that the gifts are, let's say they're ranked, and that when one receives a gift, others may be envious. But seriously, if you had, were given the gift of faith and your neighbor the gift of healing, might you not be jealous? But when we find smart people who have defined these gifts, we can come to understand that none are better to have than the other, and that is because they are of God. They are for God, and they are not meant to bolster us and build us up in any way, but to be used as an instrument of God. The definition of the gift of healing says, Healers are prayerful, and they help people understand that the healing is in the hands of God. Often their task is to bring about such understanding, other than to remove negative symptoms. While the definition of faith explains, Faith is characterized by an unshakable trust in God 
to deliver on God's promises. No matter what, the gift of faith inspires those who might be tempted to give up to hold on. I want to be a member with brothers and sisters who share those gifts. And most of us have been in a situation where a friend or a family member was not healed. But the Spirit gave the gift of faith to someone close to you. And that person was tasked with keeping you built up until your faith could be restored. As many of you know, I've lost both of my parents. Both of them, although six and a half years apart, could have been healed. They were not. My mother died of complications from ovarian cancer. She had surgery to remove the tumors, and we got great news. The surgeon had told us that he had removed all the suspect tissue, but she would need chemotherapy. The day she went for her first chemo treatment on a Thursday, the nurses had noticed that her legs were swollen, and they sent her to the ER. She was admitted on Friday, and on Sunday we gathered around her bed, and we said our goodbyes. I am thankful that my friends and family used the gifts that God had given them in my time of need. Paul continues on in verses 12 and four, through 14 to say that the body is a unit. It is comprised of many parts. Although its parts are many, they all form one body. So it is with Christ. From one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. And no matter our background, we all have received the same spirit. When we move on and get into verse 15 through 18, and here we switch into the amplified version of the Bible, Paul writes, If the foot says, because I am not the hand, am I not a part of the body? It is on the contrary still a part of the body. If the ear says, because I am not an eye, am I not a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But now, as things really are, God has placed and arranged the parts in the body, each one of them, just as he willed and saw fit with, for the best balance and function. Now, some of you know that I study karate, and I've had the opportunity to look in and take some classes in some other martial arts, and jiu-jitsu is one of those. And when I was at a class on hip throws, the instructor was talking about uh, balance and how to relieve someone of their balance in order to best be able to toss them to the ground. And while I was reading this scripture, this, pop, this memory popped back in my head. And the instructor went on to let us know that it's actually amazing that humans can stand, uh, that we should not be able to stand still. Real quick, have you ever tried to get anything to stand up with only two points of contact on the ground? Yeah, how'd that work out for you? The Reader's Digest had, public, had uh, published an article titled, How Do Humans Stand and Balance Without Falling Over? In the article, it talks about our skeleton and how it's built with two locking legs and knee joints and upright spine, providing a column of support, bearing the weight of the head, neck, and trunk, allowing us to m maintain an upright position. Balance is, however, due to more than just your bones your heart, your ear, your eyes, your brain, your spinal cord, and your muscles all work together to help you stand. You might not think you need your eyes to stand, because after all, if you're in a dark room, you can still stand. But if you spin around with your eyes closed versus opened, you would notice that it took you longer to regain that sense of balance when you tried to do it with your eyes closed. And your ears, are they needed for balance? Yeah, have, have any of you ever experienced vertigo? The ears contain fluid-filled canals with tiny stones, and as those roll around, they send information back to the brain to help keep us upright. And when you stand up, gravity lets the blood pool in your legs. But God, being God, gave us baroreceptors, and that notices the change in that, and it increases our heart rate to be able to pump that blood back up into our body so that we're able to stand now, I believe that most of you would have been able to guess that your muscles, brain, and spinal cord play an important part in maintaining balance. It is remarkable how the different body systems work together to allow us to get out of bed in the morning. 
balance becomes even more brilliant when you consider that the different parts can compensate for each other in case of injury or loss. Who here has ever been on crutches? I have. (laughs) You can still function. You can still get around from place to place. Um, I know that I was tired at the end of each day. And when I came off crutches, it was much easier to get the things done I needed to do. And I felt like I had more energy. Now, how do you think your brothers and sisters in Christ feel when they're having to carry you to be your crutch? Yes, they can get their jobs done, saving souls. But they can get tired quicker. They don't get the rest they need. And they can become burnt out. In verses 19 through 24, I'll be reading from the message. But also want you to think about this keeps your significance from getting blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye, a gigantic hand, wouldn't be a body, but a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and its important in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Could you imagine the eye telling the hand, get lost, I don't need you? Or the head telling the foot, you're fired, we phased your job out. As a matter of fact, in practice it works the other way. The lower, uh, the more basic the part, the more necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not your stomach. When it's a part of your own body, you become very concerned. It makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is, without comparison. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion over a head full of hair? I'm going to continue in verses 25 and 26. The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't see. If one hurts, every other part is involved in the hurt and the healing. If one part flourishes, Every part enters into exuberance. Verses 27 through 31. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of the body does your part mean anything. Let me read that again. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. You're familiar with some of the parts that God has formed in His church, which is the body. Those are the apostles and the prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, helpers, organizers, and those who pray and interpret tongues. But it's obvious by now, isn't it, that Christ's church is a complete body, not a gigantic unidimensional part. It's not all apostles or prophets. It's not all miracle workers or healers. Not all pray in tongues and not all interpret those prayers. And yet some of you keep competing for so-called important parts. I want you to understand that just because your top three or four gifts are not apostleship, which is the spreading of the gospel to foreign lands or cultures, or evangelism, which is the ability to share with those who have not heard the, or, about Jesus, If your top gifts is not prophecy, which is the gift of speaking the word clearly and faithfully, prophets allow God to speak through them to communicate the message that people most need to hear. If you're not a teacher, those that bring the gift of scriptural and spiritual truths to others, more than just teaching Christian education classes, teachers witness to the truth of Jesus Christ in a variety of ways. And if it's not wisdom, which is the gift of translating life experiences into spiritual truth and seeing the application of scriptural living, that doesn't mean you're not responsible for spreading the word. 
If your top gift is of knowledge, administration, shepherding, servanthood, those things still play a vital role in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. We are all members of the body of Christ. And that gifts are given to help us make disciples of Christ. I would like to take this time and thank Pastor Jonathan for giving me the opportunity to bring you this message this morning. Two different times in my life I thought I was being called to be a preacher. Once I was a freshman in college and the second time was this summer. And um, when I got back, uh, we were on vacation this summer and when I got back, um, and I was thinking about what God had said to me. Uh, Pastor Jonathan had sent me a message and said, Hey, uh, I want to talk to you about your role in the church. And I thought, Okay, God, <laughs> when you're telling more than just me, um, I- I'm going to have to listen now. And at first I thought God was telling me to be a preacher. But upon reflection, I'm pretty sure that God is telling me to, to only, he's only going to use me to bring the message as needed. A little over three weeks ago, I had finished a lay servant class, and one of the things we did in that class was take a spiritual gifts inventory. And my top three gifts were prophecy, knowledge, and teaching. And I was surprised at those results, but I am excited to see where God and how God uses me. I do encourage everyone to take a spiritual gifts survey and begin to understand what part they play in the body of Christ. Jesus came and spoke to the eleven when they had joined him on the mountain, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now there he did not say, Go therefore you evangelists, or go therefore you who have wisdom. He didn't clarify who, except for the fact he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. He's talking to everyone that we need to go out and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that Christ has taught us. And lo, I am with you, Jesus said, as always, even to the end of age. That comes from Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the Great Commission. I have one final story I want to share with you. Claire has been learning to play the flute for two and a half years. Tony played the flute in high school, And I can blow and make one note on the flute. Martha Hinchman, Craig's mother, I don't know how long she's been playing the flute. She's pretty talented. One may say she has the gift. I am definitely the weakest flautist in that group. Yet, if I were told my neighbor would die if I couldn't make a note on that flute, I would and I could do that. So why do we not make one note to save our neighbors from eternal death? Why do we not use the gift the Spirit gives us to tell our neighbors about Jesus? Romans chapter 10, verse 14. How then can they call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how then can they hear without someone to preach? Let us pray. This is the Wesleyan Covenant Prayer. Would you please join me as I read this? I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what you will, rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low by you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen.